good evening to all the delegates attendees all the panelists my name is nishan jaiswal it is my privilege today to coordinate for the fourth cxo round table conference which is a initiative of healthcare division of kaho uh, to all who know who what is consortium of accredited healthcare organizations we are very thankful to you for your patronage to joining us those who are new to kaho uh, it's a, a three division uh healthcare institution the quality professional wing and the uh, labs and uh, we are doing an extensive work in improving training a lot of healthcare professionals pan india and the nearby countries also globally uh i would like to introduce mr sam who will be the moderator for today's uh, session on turnaround strategy for hospitals uh mr mehta is a chief investment director of the atlas family office and the vice chairman of dr mehta's hospital amongst india's oldest and most respected private hospitals he is a vice president of kaho uh, he brings over two decades of enterprise leadership multinational operating project management governance strategic consulting investment management and entrepreneurial experience within leading organizations like mckinsey Mr Mehta has an MBA from Kellogg School of Management a masters in manufacturing engineering management and masters in chemical engineering thank you so much sir for joining us and moderating this session i take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for the today's session basil sir he was the vice president of wipro ji medical systems he was managing director and ceo of manipal health systems he was group executive president of apollo hospitals enterprise and executive director of sts holdings limited dhaka uh, sir is known and recognized in the industry for the transformation of manipal hospitals group which he has led for 7 years from 2002 to 2009 before joining the group was struggling with the performance and he has brought the much needed transformation most importantly the results were achieved with superlative degree of transparency 100% ethical practice and also by demonstrating genuine concern for poor patients basil sir is now the co-founder and chairman of cause bridge llp the mission is to leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to provide solutions to improve clinical outcome internal processes and bring about operational efficiencies the areas of focus are the tools that demonstrate reduce avoid harm and mortality especially in areas like hospital acquired pneumonia acute kidney injury and improve efficiencies in surgical performance he serves as an advisor and governing board member to various healthcare technology organizations medical institutions charitable service organizations and private sector sir is graduate in electrical engineering from the college of engineering and is mtech in power systems it is a privilege to have you sir to enlighten us on the turnaround strategies for the hospital i request mr sam to please moderate the session thank you sir thank you nishant uh, i think all of you are awaiting great wisdom and uh, based on our experience in a long relationship with uh, mr basil we almost call him dr basil because he is the person who we call for hospitals to be diagnosed and perhaps cured at times so hopefully we will get some good insights uh the uh model of the session is we're going to have uh, basil present to us perspectives on uh hospitals both the big and the small so if you come from a smaller uh tier 2 town or a, maybe a rural area uh, hopefully the wisdom that's imparted will be as relevant as it is for the larger hospitals in urban cities and the metros Uh, so i think the perspective is the first 30 minutes we'll have a presentation you're welcome to ask clarifying questions in the chat uh we will try and keep the time bound model of for clarification we'll ask basil and for those who got questions please put them in the q and a or in the chat i'll try and find an appropriate way on either calling on you or asking the question directly or even uh, i'm sure mr basil will be more than happy to uh, try and answer them as part of the tempo of uh, his discussion and then we'll have a proper q and a uh, and hopefully we'll have some uh, different perspectives that come through as well as some specific answers 
uh, that might be relevant for a broader group. So I think that's the model around which we're planning to do today. And I think with no further ado, uh, Mr. Basil, the floor is yours. Thank you, <coughs> Sam. <coughs> it was a great introduction, though I do not deserve most of it. <laughs> you know, so <coughs> long time ago, almost 20 odd years ago, I had an opportunity to get into healthcare from two other sectors. So I was almost <coughs> put in front of a challenging situation. And uh, uh, so I was forced to put in some of the learnings which I have had in my previous sectors. And I tried and it worked out. So most of what I'm going to present to you will contain my observations from the previous sectors and how I could adopt, how I could implement those things, the best practices in the healthcare sector. So please feel free to ask questions. And uh, I'm going to talk from the, my hands-on experience when I was in the midst of a transformational journey. So just to bring clarity to what we are trying to understand from today's you know, few minutes of uh, this pitch. Uh, <clears throat> where are we today and where we want to reach and how we are going to reach, and we would like to term it as maybe turnaround strategy. Now, the term turnaround strategy, you know, sounds something, you know, great. But frankly, it, any, for any complex problem, the solution is not complex. Solution is always simple. But what is most important is the rigor with which we implement the strategy. It should be time-bound. It should be measurable. It should have shorter milestones. Any change that happens over a longer period of time will not be felt as change. So keep something in mind about the time duration. Whenever you want to bring in transformation or change in any organization, it has to be felt, and it will be felt only when the duration is shorter. Okay. And uh, if it is not measurable, if it is not time-bound, it can always float like a star, you know, it will be a dream which, which will never be accomplished. Now, the simple concepts which all of you are already aware, in a high-performing organization, you know, what are the, the basic pillars, the, the fundamental pillars? And I would give strong value to this organization values and culture. The, the maximum significance goes to organization values and culture without which whatever you do, it's not a sustainable change. Of course, people are the, the focus behind <clears throat> these kind of initiatives. People have to contribute. Employee engagement is very, very critical when you come up with a change initiative. Process excellence, as you know, it is equally important. And measurements, unless you have measurements for each and every individual's performance, it is impossible to, you know, control the way that the organization has to move forward. Now, I talked about change in mindset. You know, it is so critical. <clears throat> I went through this about 20 years ago when I was taking over the organization. That was the biggest challenge which I faced because that organization had a history of almost 12 years before I joined them. So it was 12 years of <clears throat> mindset. People were used to something and changing that was not easy. It was a hierarchical, organiz hierarchical organization. And my challenge was to get the acceptance from everyone to make it a flat organization. And, uh, you know, people used to get instructions and some of, some of them listened to instructions. Some of them did not listen. And uh, I had to change it from command mode to alignment mode. And... A lot of people had a number of years of experience, but they were not able to contribute to the organization's performance. So it's not number of years of experience that is important. The insight is what is you know, most you know, valuable when you want to bring in changes in an organization. And instead of people competing with each other, we came up with the concept of how to cooperate. And instead of disciplining, instead of asking for discipline, each individual is encouraged, inspired to take own initiatives. And finally, from functional units, it will 
train people to work in cross functional methods and from task orientation we moved into completely result orientation and result on a weekly basis results on a monthly basis quarterly basis and so on now the most important thing when you talk about culture there are there are two important points one is accountability everyone should know that that person is accountable for certain specific deliverables the next important thing is you know the consequence you know there has to be some kind of respect towards consequence you know it's not that you know fear of consequence people should know that i am answerable for certain results within certain time frame otherwise i may have to be answerable to someone and the greatest catalyst which i have found useful for producing results is nothing but the operational freedom when you give people the adequate space to be creative you get the best out of them so sh should not interfere too much once you identify the right kind of people who can produce results give them the creative space and only have you know whatever is required in terms of interventions otherwise give them the freedom and they will produce the results and you should trust you should have the trust in people now another important criteria this which it, it has to be united team it, that cannot be internal politics which will spoil the organization so this was my first strategy when i entered that organization if i openly told everyone my first you know strategy is going to be in a politicizing the organization groupisms cannot be allowed in an organization which is looking for change everyone should put their energy towards the growth of the organization towards the transformation of the organization no other negative energy can be acceptable in an organization that is looking for turnaround <clears throat> and you will find people with a lot of attitudinal issues you know and in the earlier the better you identify those you know people and uh, encourage them to change or you need, need to take tough decisions on those people the touch point i think i need not mention the significance of touch point in the healthcare sector if this is a unique industry where customer expectations are complex and it is a mix of physical rational and emotional parameters and each demanding its own share of importance at every touch point now look at this organization of a healthcare organization you will find people from the low socio economic status you will find people with the low education levels you will find people with the low intellectual capabilities and i can categorize some of them with certain you know uh, job descriptions or titles these kind of people come under this category and you will also find people who are from the highest socio economic status highest education levels and highest intellectual capability doctors the senior management people a lot of them come under this category and you will find a large spectrum of people you know from the medium socio economic status education levels and intellectual capability now mutual respect is something which is a mandatory thing in this kind of an organization where you have three kinds of layers of people you know and everyone has to understand the importance of the other person though they may be from a low socio economic status and educational level and intellectual capability the one which will take the organization forward is the mutual respect and then you look at your clients your 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 patients you know your customers patients also come from different category in the society and we can't choose your patients because they come and uh, we are supposed to deliver the best of the care to them and you will see a major complex interaction between the organization and your customers and no other industry can you know you know i, I can't think of any other industry with so much of complex you know uh, touch points expectations and most of the you know the expectations are not measurable you know uh, uh, there are a lot of emotions feelings you know inexplainable you know parameters that play a lot in this industry so this is quite a complex industry if you really study that so <clears throat> what makes the organization move forward is some kind of a 
clarity about the relationships between different kinds of people who work in an organization, mutual respect. And this is something I would like to personally emphasize. You know, in today's world, we find a lot of unethical practice in healthcare industry. And uh, that's one of the reasons most of the patients have some kind of apprehension towards the private sector and the corporate sector hospitals. So what you achieve is important. At the same time, how you achieve is equally important. You know, without <clears throat> sacrificing value system, when we are touching lives, we are not expected to be unethical. And this is something which we must preserve in our minds when you are looking for change. <clears throat> now, there, is, there are many studies conducted about the leadership style is strongly correlated with quality care and associated measures. I'm not going to explain in detail, but I think you can go through the, the headings, the different kinds of leadership styles. <clears throat> the transformational leadership style, transactional leadership style, and uh, autocratic style. In fact, autocratic style, I understand, is not a you know style which is undesirable. And people say it's supposed to be good in certain emergency situations. And you can make a note of this particular term called a laissez-faire leadership style. This is one situation where the leader does not take any decisions. He or she allows things to happen the way it happens. And task-oriented and relationship-oriented. See, any kind of leadership, you know, whatever is mentioned here, you know, the most ideal one is transformational leadership. And the most undesirable one, which is a definite no, is the laissez-faire kind of leadership where the leader never takes decisions. <clears throat> so, you know, that's not an option, especially when you want to bring in change, a leader who cannot take decisions is cannot be there at all. Now, <clears throat> and now, you know, you're familiar with this kind of a traffic junction in most of the Indian, you know, cities and towns. Even if the traffic signal is green, there, there is, you know, some kind of a fallacy with this signal. Is everything okay? Is it safe to proceed even if the light is green? And many patients, you know, walk into hospitals with this kind of uncertainty. Even if, you know, you make a lot of noise about, you know, the, the brand, Ultimately, when patients walk into a hospital, you know, they are not truly comfortable. They always have some kind of apprehension and concern in their minds. Now I'm getting into the topic of the performance. I've seen many, organiz many hospital organizations, you know, including the organizations where I worked. <clears throat> at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, there are presentations. The CEOs make presentations. And you'll find many of them claim that these results have been achieved. Now, frankly, most of them are stating their performance. They're, you know, very rarely I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen good people, you know, leaders who are driving performance. But generally, I have found people in healthcare sector, after the completion of a month or a quarter or a, or a half year term or a full year, they come and present things as if, you know, things have been achieved with a lot of planning. But something which I found missing is this particular, you know, uh, parameter called demand forecasting by hospitals. And, uh, you know, this is a subject which is very, you know, uh, of course, people put some figures, but very often I have found there's no major scientific logic behind the demand forecasting. And uh, I'm just putting three or four categories, three categories, you know, a startup hospital and a hospital which is, you know, about two to three years old and a hospital which is more than three years old or a hospital with, say, 60% occupancy or less than, you know, 60% occupancy. A hospitals with, say, more, more than 60% occupancy and hospital which is doing reasonably well, you know, what they would look for in terms of primary financial objectives, you know. Uh, in the hospital which has just started, hospital which is not doing all that well, the challenge will be in faster ramping up of utilization of assets, faster break even. That will be their dream. And uh, when you look at an organization which has done reasonably okay, 
they will look at increasing the utilization of assets. They would want to have improved profitability and they would like to have better return on capital. And similarly, utilize it. now when you look at the hospitals which have reached steady state performance, you know, that's where, you know, you find, you know, the real challenging situations where you have to, you know, um, uh, analyze number of parameters and we will discuss about those points, you know, how an organization is really doing well. Do they need to have change as a subject and what they should do to enhance their performance? So different organizations, so there are focus methods, but behind every focus method, the measurements are common. You know. First of all, you should have all comprehensive services, whatever you have uh, designed for the hospital in terms of services, you must have those services available. You must have those consultants available. You must have those teams available and uh, quality. You know, need not mention anything more than, you know, about quality because it's a forum. <coughs> <Sorry. clears throat> Which is, you know, spreading the message of quality in a big way. And marketing and branding, you know, it is every, you know, if you look at all these types of hospitals, whether it's tier one, tier two, tier three, startup, you know, someone who has already accomplished uh, more than 80% occupancy, all of them need, many of these things are common in nature. Now, forecasting, you know, the very rarely, you know, I find people doing it with using a lot of scientific data. And then at the end of the month, coming and saying these, these initiatives helped us to produce these, these results, or these, these initiatives are going to help us to produce these results in the next quarter, in the next year. So the milestones have to be put in front of the, you know, the organization and the entire team has to work towards that. <clears throat> so the fact remains one measurement does not fit at all. When we talk about turnaround strategy, you know, what works for one hospital may not be the, 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 the model that might work for something else. Because you need to understand what is making the organization, you know, not perform well. If you understand that, if you understand the surroundings, if you understand the organization well, the culture, the people, then you can really, you know, come up with solutions for every specific case. Now, asset utilization measurement factors, you know, uh, time, time is an asset. Uh, I'm sure many of you will agree with me, you know, it's not just time, you know, the utilization of time is equally important. And uh, I still recall when we were wanting to enhance performance, we introduced the early morning OPDs and e late evening OPDs, the Sunday OPDs, holiday clinics. And that helped us to add more and more consultants. That helped us to add more and more outpatients. That helped us to get more and more you know, con conversion factor through that more and more inpatients. But someone has to continuously track and monitor what is happening. <clears throat> and uh, number of general uh, sub and super speciality consultants. You know, the way to grow is to enhance more and more consultants. The success of a hospital is totally linked to the success of each individual doctor practicing in the hospital. So if you make the doctors successful and the team to support them well, the organization will be successful. And clinical mix of services, you know, high acuity, you know, when you spend a lot of money for your uh, tier, you know, your tertiary care, your quaternary care hospital, huge capital is involved. So that capital is meant to, you know, really serve high equity cases. You know, so you create center of excellence specialities. And uh, one of the objectives, and the financial objectives of this is also to ensure that you realize high ARPOB, average revenue per operating per day. And multiple methods, you need to have measurements for even the slightest, you know, the performance possible. Uh, that not only includes daycare procedures, you know, you can, you know, nowadays you have even telemedicine, you know, as a, as a stream of service. So telemedicine is an area which is contributing substantially. Conversion factor, I intentionally colored it because I've not seen hospitals really studying conversion factors. You know, what is really making conversion factor good for certain clients, certain doctors, 
and conversion factor not good for certain uh, other doctors, certain specialities, and not good for certain other specialties. In patient numbers, you know, and uh, categorization of different kinds of surgeries, number of OTs and uh, OT utilization by specialty, and how do you measure this OT utilization? And there has to be a standard methodology and uh, acceptable, you know, uh, formula for this. And I see best category-wise utilization, lab tests, and it goes on, on and on. Okay. Pharmacy and capital equipment. Why capital equipment? Because, you know, the investment is too huge. So you need to understand what is that, you know, we can do to enhance productivity of all these investments. So before you do the forecasting, you know, you need to understand the, 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 the pillars, the components which can help us to forecast. Forecasting has to be segregated into smaller components. It should be based on this. It's not just financial numbers. And basic assumptions taken into consideration, market opportunity. I've seen, you know, very rarely people studying this, you know, the prevalence of certain disease conditions in certain region. You know, uh, we went through this, you know, when uh, I was part of an institution in Bangladesh. We found out, you know, the prevalence of, you know, cancer, like in India, was very high, but they did not have enough of infrastructure within the country, enough of hospitals with the, so we added that service. And when we also found out people have a lot of kidney disease conditions, so we enhanced uh, the nephrology department adding more and more, you know, dialysis machines, doctors, and so on. So you need to always understand. You should have a clear understanding of what is going around the market. You know, the market involves the feeder region also, not only the same city where you are. And uh, really, you know, the private insurance team, it goes on and on. You know, these are the basic, fun the, 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 the fundamental components with which you assume and then come up with a demand forecast. Availability of the specialities and capital deployed in the hospital assets, clinical mix we already talked about, average length of stay, operation theater utilization goes on and on and uh, like this, and, and conversion ratios of various specialities. We'll discuss in detail about conversion ratios soon. <clears throat> we talked about the market, the competition, the potential. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> General trend tendency is to use the historical data. You know, we achieved these figures in the past quarter, and we will show a certain uh, percentage of growth this quarter. And uh, or last year we did so much, and this year we show certain growth. We rarely look at, you know, when we create the budget, the potential of the organization should do more. So monthly forecast focused on achieving annual budget. That's a common practice, you know. And when we find that we are not reached the required running rate, then we <clears throat> look at what is left and then we look at what is asking rate. And then we generally tend to give a figure which will match with the annual, which will match with the annual budget. Now, there's nothing but we are postponing the, 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 the problem. Instead of achieving it in a, in, a, in, a, in a specific quarter, we keep adding to the subsequent quarters. And we claim that we will achieve the subsequent quarter, but we end up not achieving those figures. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes there can be specific initiatives which can add to your forecast. You know, camps, outlocation clinics, uh, you know, and if you have a good key account team dealing with a lot of uh, your referral hospitals, they will be able to, you know, predict in advance what are the likely, you know, acuity of cases which are coming in and who are likely to, you know, uh, send cases to the, the, the main hospital. <clears throat> and if there's a poor quality forecast, what happens? It really impacts the cash flow. And it is a lot of, you know, chain of associated reactions. You know, you may not be able to pay suppliers in time, increase cost of sourcing because you do not pay, you know, it, the, 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 the cost gets added and credit terms with suppliers getting impacted. And uh, imagine a situation when surgeons have to remain <clears throat> without doing surgeries, you know, look at their, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, what kind of spirit they will have. And in, I've seen extreme cases 
you know, there are in, you know there were institutions who have closed down certain specialities because they're not able to understand and produce the right kind of uh, forecast. <clears throat> Very commonly seen challenges in hospitals. You know, patients we already talked about and hospitals concerned. Suboptimal utilization of infrastructure. <clears throat> That's our subject today. You know, how do you enhance that? How do you bring in change? How do you turn around? And very often we find the inadequate data. So a good hospital system can always address this challenge. And insurance companies, they very often do not trust the, the hospitals. So we need transparent methods to convince them that what the hospitals are doing are exactly in line with their norms. Additional burdens on doctors and nurses and paramedical staff due to lack of proper, reliable, timely information. Most of you must have already you know, faced this, you know, in different OPD situations, different uh, inpatient management situations for want of data, people suffer, people struggle. <clears throat> and the, the finance, the, the head goes through this kind of challenges. Sometimes loss of revenue, you know, you're not able to capture all the data you know, appropriately. You're not able to understand the activity-based costs. And th that's a subject which is still evolving in the hospital sector. And finally, the performance, performers versus non-performers. There has to be a differentiation between these two categories of people. <clears throat> so simple, the, this is a co common, you know, uh, you know, what methodology, what gets measured gets managed and what gets managed only gets done. So whenever we do measurements, we have to ensure that we are measuring what is important to customer. That will ultimately produce great results, great change, and get a turnaround for the institution. And when it comes to branding and when it comes to marketing, what we need to keep in mind as the fundamental, you know, the, the requirement is listening to the voice of the customer and willing to accept our own inadequacies and willing to change with a sincere heart. You know, we should never feel, you know, uh, uh, irritated when we get a, you know, complaint about our institution. There are enough of, you know, implementable actions, you know, behind every feedback. You know, this is nothing, you know, new to what I'm, you know, now what I'm saying, nothing new to any of you. Good service creates good hospital image. Good service creates loyal customers. Good service increases turnover and revenues. And good service cuts cost. <clears throat> good service is therapeutic. It's, it accelerates the healing process and recuperation. And nothing is much more powerful than good service when it comes to branding. You know, People will talk about it. And uh, by word of mouth, it gets spread. One of the methods which we had implemented in a couple of institutions where I had the opportunity to work to ensure the, the, the greatest amount of you know, uh, patient satisfaction was proactive service. At every touch point, it is possible to create a document that at this touch point, our patients or our, you know, the, the, the customers, it means patients, you know, not only patients, the relatives who come with the customers, they have certain expectations. I can give an example of a telephone conversation. You know, I think you must all try, try and contact your, 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 your hospital on a, on a telephone line and look at the quality of, you know, uh, response you get and within how many rings they pick up the phone call. You know, it's very, very tough to find telephone calls being properly responded to. Are they really, uh, uh, you know, responding to the need of the caller? Which is, I'm just giving telephone call as, an, as, as, a, as a touch point. We can really write down what is expected, you know, at, at, during a telephone conversation. Similarly, at every touch point, whether it's a reception area, whether it's an OPD area, whether it is... Uh, uh, a, a patient being taken to surgery at the at the point of anesthesia. At every point, there is certain level of expectation at the emergency. It is possible to document what is what are the expectations and deliver those requirements 
before being asked for, the unsolicited. You provide that, you will never have complaints. So, and this is something which is worthwhile, you know, it's, it's, you know, trying it out. And all of you have enough adequate knowledge, you know, you have enough knowledge to write down, this is an expectation at this touch point and provide those services at that touch point. Predictability, is it possible to predict clinical dissatisfaction? Is there a process possible to predict clinical dissatisfaction? This we tried and we found it to be possible, it is possible. You know, by informal chat with patients, relatives and patients, sometimes you get signals that how comfortable they are in the first day. Have they got their feedback from their consultant? Have they got, you know, what they were expecting? And we can give advanced signals to those respective, you know, consultants, you know, through a very friendly methodology, a friendly process, which tells them, that this patient is not too happy, this patient is expecting something, and that message has to go. And there has to be, a, you know, it has to be received well. You know, the process has to be explained to every, you know, the team member, saying that what we are trying to do is to avoid a clinical dissatisfaction issue, proactiveness, rather than being reactive. Extended OPD, as we already talked about, and creation of service support units. There are related departments, you know, which, which, you know, we can cluster them together and we can create managers for those departments. For, to give an example, say, uh, general medicine and, uh, say, cardiology. You know, if there is a cardiac, you know, uh, referral that has to go from a general medicine, you know, this kind of, you know, referrals, you know, it helps to have someone who is heading <clears throat> a cluster of related service groups. And through this, we can also create leadership positions within an organization. You know, sometimes you need to encourage people by giving them recognition. So some of these leadership positions will be of help to encourage people. And uh, it helps to create good cross reference. And uh, <clears throat> it's really, I, we have found it useful and many hospitals are found to be using this methodology now. <clears throat> and every year we can come up with specific themes to, to focus the attention of the entire the, the team, the energy of the organization can be focused towards a specific team, which you are very much in need of. <clears throat> the hospital wants to do certain things in a specific year or a specific uh, quarter. You can come up with specific themes and uh, inspire the attention, you know, create <clears throat> inspirational attention from everybody to produce results towards that. <clears throat> and getting into the topic of this length of stay in terms of centers of excellence and department. This is a very important subject when you want to look at change. <coughs> uh, <coughs> needless to mention the importance of uh, clinical pathways. And uh, very often we found these are all remaining in, uh, in the form of standards and uh, so in, in certain systems, in certain hard copy form and soft form. But we need to ensure that these things are strictly followed. And then you are able to contain the number of stay within the stipulated average length of stay. The cohort of cases in the ward delivers better level of care. It really helps. And reduction of complications, comorbidity and infections and errors, everything in a proactive, on, on, in a, on a proactive basis. Identification of potentially long-standing patients and planning their discharge with clear focus on you know, the lab results within the broad time frame you want with the lab results and pharmacy processing time and so on. And uh, this is applicable to each doctor, you know, the reducing lenders for individual consultants. And many hospitals follow this care team meeting coordination. It integrates, you can, you know, the good integration between consultants, medical department representatives, family members, and this helps you to plan the care and discharge. And you need to have the consultant buy-in. It cannot be without the consultant's, you know, clear understanding, we can have this. And uh, through service line managers, you can have these steps, admission to discharge, care coordination, monitoring of the clinical pathway, reduction of, you know, barrier of patients in care. And this is a subject which, uh, I just want to stay focused here on the, you can see there are various departments in a, in a, in a hospital. 
And uh, if you sort of trace the conversion ratio and average length of stay, certain departments fall in certain category, uh, certain combination of categories. The high average length of stay, low conversion is one category. And uh, high average length of stay, high conversion is another category. Low average length of stay, low conversion. <clears throat> and you have finally the low average length of stay and high conversion. I'll go to the next slide and tell you there are certain situations. What all? This is something which I had to really <clears throat> study when I was uh, in, in one of the organizations in Bangladesh. I found our conversion rate was very, very low when compared to the conversion rates in a comparable city, you know, that's in Calcutta, in a, in a comparable hospital. Huge difference. <clears throat> we were having something like, say, 2,000 patients a day, but the admission was, you know, in the range of, so say, 100, 150 from, you know, uh, on an everyday basis. And then we need to, we, 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 we were in a situation to, you know, really study and compare and do whatever is required to be done. And uh, it revealed that many actions were possible. And we created a team just for the improvement of conversion ratio. The team comprising of, you know, uh, doctors, team comprising of, uh, the team was headed by, of course, the medical director, the team comprising of a customer care, you know, the patient care coordinators, Every morning, we used to get an Excel spreadsheet. You know what it contained? It contained the previous day's positive reports, a positive CT report, a positive MRI report, a positive lab report. You know, and very often, this was you know, shared amongst the small group of people to find out whether the patient was really taking the service from the hospital or the patient had gone out after a positive report. So we started tracking the positive results of every test done in the hospital, whether it's a lab test or radiology or anything. And then we started, you know, focusing on that patient. And there are people to talk to them nicely without giving them the feeling that we are becoming over aggressive. You know, we have to be extra careful to ensure that you don't create a feeling that we are commercial and we are, you know, it has to be done with a lot of sincerity, you know, a lot of understanding of the patient, clinical situation and family situation. We need to engage with them and talk to them. And we started tracking and we could improve our conversion ratio overall for the hospital by around two and a half to three percent over a period of about six months. So this is something which is doable. And this is not a practice in, in, in most of the Indian hospitals, you know, just tracking the conversion ratio understanding the reasons why the conversion ratios are, are not adequate for certain doctors or certain specialities and what ought to be done to enhance that. This is worth doing. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so what focus is required when the situation is low conversion and high average length of stay? When there's high average length of stay, you need to focus on clinical pathways and reduce the average length of stay. You have to adhere to you know, uh, the, the, the pathway discipline and improve rehabilitation so that it, will not, it, it does not affect your average length of stay. Faster discharges, improve diagnostic turnaround time. Anyway, I'm going to share these slides with uh, every participant through the CAHO headquarters, so you will get it. <clears throat> Similarly, High conversion, high average length of stay. Where should you focus on? Low conversion, low average length of stay. Where you should focus on? And what are the things that you should measure? <clears throat> I... <clears throat> this is another method which I, I, I do not know, you know, uh, but I have found it as uh, as as a uh, useful tool it gives an idea you know actually it's from your own hospital it's not from any other hospital you know your hospital will have many departments some departments do very well and some departments may not do very well now this approach has helped me to study what are those factors which are making certain departments do extraordinarily well can we imbibe those factors in those departments which are not doing well uh, see, 
I'm giving an example. Interventional cardiology is number one in revenue ranking. And, but it's not number one in interventional, you know, when it comes to profit rank, it is only number five. Now, if you study, <clears throat> there could be multiple reasons why you are not number one when it comes to interventional cardiology in, in terms of profit. And that analysis will help you to, you know, behind every number, there is a hidden, actionable, implementable, time-bound, you know, uh, initiative. It's hidden there. So you need to study this and you will find multiple things can be done. Orthopedics is number two in ranking in terms of revenue, but it's only number six in terms of uh, profit ranking for the hospital. Gastroenterology is number three in revenue ranking, but number two in terms of profit ranking. It goes on and on. It gives an indication that there are certain actions possible either to enhance your revenue component for that particular department or to enhance your profit component. But you need to sit and study that. What is making that organization, you know, not make adequate profit, though they are making substantial. It could be one could be because, you know, you have a high profit capital investment. Now, but in spite of that, there could be other reasons why a department with the highest revenue ranking is not showing the highest profit rank. <clears throat> and sometimes you, you, you need not, you know, sometimes you have investments because you need to have comprehensive offering of services. Every measurement need not be just based on, every investment should not be just based on return on investment in a hospital setup. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I'm just giving you these arrow marks. The arrow marks are some indications that there are hidden action points in behind certain numbers for every department. Now, this is a challenge which I have seen, you know, with hospitals which are doing very well. You know, they don't because they have lots of patients and uh, they do not look at the need for change, you know, which is really you know, a sad situation. And I've seen such organizations over a period of time. They may be doing well, but they lose their goodwill in the organization, their goodwill amongst the clients, amongst the patients. This is called problem of plenty. And it leads to complacency. You know, we are doing very well. So you don't look at the areas of change required. Why? Why should we spend time on this at all? And problem of past glory. You know, we've been there for a long time, and you know, and we have a great brand equity. And this is dangerous situation. Right? We can't afford to be complacent in this sector. And uh, something is very, you know, uh, those people who attended the last meeting, they have seen this. Why I, I, you know, why it is so important that you need to look at change in the growth phase. You, know, you can't look at change when you, you, know, you think you're not doing well at all. So this is the product life cycle you know, or the life cycle of uh, any organization. It, it has an inception stage, it has a growth stage, it has a maturity stage, it has a decline phase. Now, Performance problems, you know, starts at this point A, which is almost at the negative trend of the performance of the organization. And there is a point of the renewal that is required. The renewal point is point B. That's where you need to bring in a lot of changes, <clears throat> new direction, and you need to bring in, you know, the required, uh, you know, turnaround and the transformation. And that this is, of course, you know, you're more familiar with this term called sigmoid curve. And that's the point to make the change point B. And because at that point of time, you have energy, you have money, you have time, and you have the attitude to bring in all the changes. So the secret to constant growth is to start a new sigmoid curve before the first one that turns out. And that is true even for personal life. A good life is probably a succession of second curves started before the first curve fails. Now, the role of a, the leader, especially in a, in a complex setup, like a hospital setup, the role of a CEO, the role of a, 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 a promoter who is a decision maker, is orchestration of all resources. It's an orchestrated application of caregiver knowledge, skills, expertise, technology, supplies, and medications. I think, you know, change will come only with that kind of, a, you know, a leadership. A leadership which abandoned perseverance, commitment, 
and who understands the team, who understands the culture needs, the change requirements. So my you know, pitch was only aimed at triggering some thoughts, you know, and um, I'm going, I'm willing to take questions at this stage. You know, if, if I cannot answer, I make a note and then I will try and answer later. Thanks and a lot. Many, uh, many of our members can also pitch in and give your answers because I am not an expert. You know, I am still in the learning process. So thanks a lot, Basil. I think we've already had some questions, but let's set the context. So some of the things that we heard is obviously uh, get the team heading in one direction, doing it together, planning and forecasting being very key components of success. Uh, yeah. Setting expectations sounds like a key common ingredient. Obviously, what gets measured uh, gets attention and therefore gets managed. And concepts like touch points, conversions, and some uh, good metrics. So I think let's take this two steps further uh, a little bit into the conversation. We'll start with some of the questions that uh, we talked a lot about the hospital system. We have not talked about uh, the patient too much in terms of the patient perceived value, empathy, and the likes uh, of that. There's a group of questions from Dr. Atul on that context. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So I assume that the focus was more from, uh, let's get the basics right before we start doing the advanced stuff like our customers. Huh? Right. Question is, uh, we haven't talked too much about the patient's perceived value. We haven't talked about too much about the empathy of a patient and ingredients like that, that you typically start looking at when you're entering, uh, let's say a typical hospital evaluation, not necessarily a turnaround. Uh, right. So I guess the, the real question is, at which point do we start paying serious attention to the patient? And my uh, guesstimate to help you would be that first get the basics right of getting data flowing in the system, right? Yeah. Uh, but do you have any perspective on at what point do we start engaging the customers and the customer experience? Yeah, it's, see, that's where I, I use the point called the touch point. You know, I even gave an example of, you know, the touch the point call, correct. Even, before, even before the hospital, the patient, comes to the hospital, the touch point is a telephone call sometimes. How you, you know, there's an, you know, they, they imagine if a, a patient is calling, you know, it's not a patient, even if, imagine a, a midnight call coming to your hospital, middle of the night, and imagine a call coming during daytime. The anxiety level attached to the call in the middle of the night is far different from the call that is, you know, uh, coming in the daytime. Now, I think somewhere I have touched on this point. So you need to train your people to be sensitive. I'm just giving an example of telephone call. How to respond to the, the, the caller's requirement. For example, middle of the call, maybe because there is a, you know, uh, a, a cardiac arrest and when, when a person picking up the phone should be capable of answering the call, you know, answering the need of the caller. You should not say, no, no, hold on, I will connect you to somebody. You know, very often, you know, uh, if you try a hospital, uh, on a telephone line, the call gets connected to somebody else, somebody else, and they, sometimes it may not get answered at all. So the sensitivity, you know, has to be the, 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 the to be understood by every person at every touch point. That's why I talked about proactiveness. You know, write a document. You know, to you know what would be the expectation of each of, of a patient or a patient's by st or stand or a, or a relative who's coming into the hospital. And ensure that it is delivered without being asked for. You know, I've seen in certain hospitals, for example, parking. You know, parking is a major challenge. You, you don't see hospitals where you know the patients are given priority for parking. You know, when a when a, when a patient comes to the hospital, that's a you know sometimes it's a big big problem. So we have to think through from a patient perspective, the patient centric decision making in terms of Whatever initiative you are taking inside a hospital, it should be patient friendly. You know, the, so it is doable. It is you know it is you know it can be documented. You know, in terms of what what is expected at this point, these are the three four criteria, and then ensure that it is implemented. You know, it's a big subject. You know, one of the reasons perhaps I have, I have missed out putting it as a caption was because it's a huge subject. 
you know i still recall you know we had uh, 115 uh, no, what do you call uh, micro cameras and microphones connected in a hospital and we were recording the interactions between the hospital employee and the patient party and these were touch points where it was not conflicting with the patient privacy requirements and we used that as a powerful tool for training people you know we used that powerful tool for uh, you know uh, incentivizing people we told them this is not a big brother watching you this is and we never reprimanded people based on what we observed on this particular system it really helped the entire organization culture changed within a span of a weeks time when we put this and told them this is intense this is may this is designed to coach you incentivize you and this will never reprimand you and it's helped a lot the entire organizational culture changed when we used a small system like this it was a closed circuit tv system but it it was under the control of the human resource department and the ceo it was not under the control of security staff so multiple initiatives are possible to ensure the patient experience is the best you know beyond what they they, they anticipated provided we have a system of record, documenting it and and proactively offering it without being asked for unsolicited offering of service so uh, i think basil let's take a slightly different track uh, a number of the folks on this call uh, uh either early into their career uh who are moving from quality into operational leadership uh and uh, it would be handy because you've sat in their shoes once upon a life uh what would be the three operational and three financial metrics that okay. they should absolutely be on top of clearly you've talked about uh if you were to look at clinical metrics it would be average length of stay it would be conversion from op to ip but what would be like the absolute three on each that people should just be aha uh-huh. yeah it's nothing but uh, your uh, uh starting with outpatients the number of outpatients the number of inpatients and uh, acuity you know that's something which i feel you know how, what kind of cases are you getting you know if it is a small clinic we can understand you know you can get uh, some cold and cough but not for a hospital with huge investments so how do you create that you know so the most important thing is you know we look at numbers numbers look at so but the, the quality of numbers is important outpatients in patients say sometimes you get patients directly to intensive care units you know if you have a great intensive care uh, department with great uh, reputation so numbers mean nothing but the op numbers ip numbers you know then the operation theater numbers then um, the, the 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 labs you know are all the people who are coming to your hospital are they taking your lab tests or not are they going out all the people who are coming to your hospital are they buying medicines from your pharmacies or not are they going out so these are very basic simple measurements to understand how effectively you know you are running the organization uh and then the of course you know you talked about the average length of stay the the, the operational is nothing but you know how effectively you are getting all this you know the the the, the outpatients these are productive numbers in patients mm-hmm. outpatients the operation theater utilization and uh, average length of stay is definitely a very important requirement and then the, the clinical mix that's where the acuity very often we don't study this clinical mix i was trying to introduce something which is not normally practiced you know how do you enhance the the clinical component you know the clinical acuity you know uh, that's something with we, we we have to you know i think for the newcomers this will be a good subject you know suppose you have you know a neurosurgery team you have a you know orthopedic team you have a cardiac you know team how do you enhance that those components because that helps you to add you know to your revenue average revenue per operating bed you know day it goes up when you have high value you know uh, high acuity of cases clinical cases i guess a, a related question that's come from mr venkateshnathan which is 
a lot of hospitals obviously promote their surgical departments aggressively and perhaps don't focus on their medical departments in terms of budgets or salaries. Uh, is this a key reason for sickness in hospitals? <laughs> Yeah. The inverse, uh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. the case, yes. it's, it's, it's a good question, yeah. But I think what we have to realize is, you know, surgical departments are equally important because uh, a lot of capital is deployed there. And uh, But one thing we should not miss out is the other departments, you know, create more and more cases for this uh, surgical departments. Give an example, say gastroenterology. If you have a good gastroenterology team, your uh, general surgery numbers go up. You know, if you have a good, you know, general medicine team, your cardiac cases can be picked up there and uh, referrals to cardiology goes up. So it is not the right attitude if, you know, if uh, uh, the management is not giving adequate importance to even the general specialities. And, or the, the, the medicine specialities. It is because they, they have the potential to create more and more referrals for a hospital. For the, yeah. So. Uh, no, thanks. I, I think uh, there are quite a few questions around how do you keep consultants happy? How do you engage consultants? How do you align consultants uh, to profitability? Uh, a little bit around consulting salary versus fee for service, uh, but in general, I think it's alignment with consultants uh, seems yeah. to be a key component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th this is a, a complex subject, but it's not a difficult subject. I've gone through this phase, you know, in fact, the biggest challenge I faced when I was trying to introduce some changes in an organization was always the senior most consultants who are very successful consultants. You know, they had... Uh, certain level of insecurity when change was being introduced as a topic for discussion. Uh, you know, so the only methodology was to ensure uh, that their fear was a misplaced fear, just to convince them. So I had to spend a lot of time explaining to them, you know, why we are bringing in certain changes. But wonderful talk, sir. And uh, as usual, uh, you are charismatic. You are so practical, so to the point. So thank you very much. And we continue to be, we'll be gaining from your wisdom. Thank you so much.